Next, uh, joining us on uh, this stage will be Alan Chua from the um, FWD Group. Uh, he's a solutions and integrations architect there. He'll be talking to us about the 11 things you need to know to be a serverless API ninja. Hey, welcome, Alan. Welcome. Can you hear me? Hey, yes. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, you want to share your screen? Okay, cool. So, okay, awesome. Yeah, great. Okay, then. Yes. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, hello everyone in the serverless community and the api community across the globe so i hope that you're doing well across these challenging times so my presentation is all about serverless apis and the cool things that you can do with it so let's start with a little bit of introduction about myself so i'm a solutions and integrations architect at fwd group i have one and a half years of experience with serverless technologies so basically my team is using serverless technologies for 90 percent of our work and i'm writing a book about serverless and you can access it with the uh, qr code in the screen so basically today we're going to tackle the uh, basics of serverless and the uh, cool integrations that you can do with serverless APIs as well as a few things that uh, you need to be cautious when working with serverless APIs. So let's start with the first item. So serverless means efficiency. So basically uh, I really want, I really like seeing serverless as an equivalent of the word efficiency because uh, you don't have to manage servers plus you drive the cost of hiring the people that are actually managing the servers and you can also reduce the security costs recent costs associated with managing the servers at home so if you think about it like AWS is hiring top of the line serverless security uh, stuff and by using serverless alone it's, uh, it's similar to asking these world-class professionals to manage your APIs. So one more cool thing about serverless is that you pay for what you use. So you don't pay for idle time. So you only pay for the actual runtime of your APIs. And given these three behaviors, uh, what I, uh, the, my favorite part about like serverless is that it's built in high availability and this has this has to recover things so basically uh for serverless like uh in lambda function the lambda functions in aws basically select an availability zone across the region so your function is always going to be available all the time and it's going to be resilient to disasters because uh even if one data center goes down in the region you can instantly run into the other availability zones due to its nature. So a use case that we actually built for FWD is that uh, we computed the uh, assume, we computed an assumed cost of the EC2 servers to be around $270 if we use the following factors. This is on screen. And uh, last month we made around 96 uh, thousand API calls worth of 91 hours of actual runtime uh, distributed across 71 cloud formation stacks in our dev environment for free. So we also use around 6.6 .6 million Q messages for dev environment and we paid only two dollars thanks to serverless architecture and uh, we assume that our savings for last month is around 19 0.7k worth of uh, compute power. So I didn't factor in the uh, salary or the manpower required to pay for the professionals that will manage the servers. So this is actually a bigger price, but just to showcase like the difference between the compute cost of serverless and traditional architectures, I included this case study. And then, uh, one more cool thing that you need to know about working with AWS Lambda is that it's way cooler when you use automation with it. So basically, automation helps to you to achieve reliable and repeatable builds since it's automated and it allows you to reduce human errors and it 
helps you to improve the maintainability of your applications. Plus, it also, it's also a way of protecting your business from developer turnover because the automation scripts could be considered as documentations themselves. And then, uh, so I set up uh, a little bit of sample of why shell scripting is important. So basically we use it for CI, CD, dependency management and decommissioning of serverless stacks plus the validation related stuff. And then uh, we also use CloudFormation and SAM so we can define serverless resources and local testing of functions. And then we also really like SAM because it's a shorthand syntax of CloudFormation so cloud formation is a way to group your AWS resources so that you can easily manage them in the AWS uh, portal. So this QR code will lead you to an automation sample code that I uploaded in GitHub. So later on the day, you can play with the shell scripts and some templates that I provided. And this is how they look like when you actually navigate to this sample. So basically you get a cool bash shell, a shell script and some cloud formation templates inside. So the next thing is that serverless is not limited to Lambda functions. The most common misconception about serverless is that serverless is equal to Lambda function and compute and it's limited to that. But actually that's wrong because any AWS service that you don't manage in the OS and the infrastructure level is serverless. Uh, the most popular AWS serverless services for building APIs are DynamoDB, Lambda Functions, SQS, X-Ray and CloudWatch plus API gateways. So the next thing that you need to know about AWS Lambda is that it has a good amount of integration points. So tons of people are skeptical about Lambda integration capabilities, especially when uh, they hear the first time. So back in 2016, people are bashing Lambda big time because of its integration capabilities. But hey, it's been five years since 2016 and AWS introduced cool integration since. So you can do things like basic CQRS with Lambda for a very cheap price. Traditionally, you'll have to pay a lot of server-related uh, costs for this. And then you can also do SecureRS and DynamoDB streaming. And there's a lot more possibilities with integrating serverless to S3 buckets, to Kinesis streams. And if you use this QR code, you will be able to view the documentation of AWS about Lambda integrations. The next thing that a serverless ninja need to know about running shared code using Lambda uh, is that you need to run your shared code in Lambda layers. So Lambda-based APIs require endpoints to be packaged in isolation. And this often leads to code duplication. And the most notorious duplicates across these endpoints are the shared code and the dependencies inside these APIs. So things like Moment.js, Axios, Usually people use, utilize them across the entire endpoint set and this just simply duplicate them carelessly. So in order to solve this, uh, you, I would recommend to use uh, the, the usage of Lambda layers. So basically it's a way to centralize dependencies so that you can update codes easier and that you'll achieve smaller deployment of packages. So if you want to try out Lambda layers, I also uploaded a code sample on GitHub using this QR code. So the next thing that you need to know to become serverless in Ninja is that there's a difference between integrating and infusing artificial intelligence into your APIs. So digital transformation have recently gained tons of traction and AI is riding this wave. Lucky for us, we can either infuse or integrate AI models to Lambda APIs. So when you say you want to integrate with a base API powered by AI, you can use like cloud services like cloud, Amazon Recognition and Cloud Vision and then invoke them from your Lambda functions. So this QR code will lead you to a very nice article by Alex DeVry. Check it out after the presentation. And I mentioned earlier that infusing is different from integrating as you can upload your custom built models using scikit-learn and TensorFlow to actually generate frozen models inside the APIs. One of the most unorthodox approach of um, embedding machine learning inside APIs is, the, is combining multiple versions of a single model and then 
building an election out of it so that you can achieve higher percentage API. In machine learning, like uh, it's uh, common knowledge that a model can only tackle at least 80 to 90% of uh, the target data set. So sometimes if you pick a different algorithm, uh, it will result a different set of 80% of that data set. So if you build in like uh, and combine multiple AI models together, you can easily form an election system, which will allow you to get and yield higher results from those models. So if you want to learn about embedding scikit-learn models inside Lambda functions, there's a nice article by Will High, which is involved, uh, is accessible from this QR code. The next big thing about Lambda functions is that it allows you to integrate RPA in your serverless APIs. So RPA is a huge advantage in the insure tech world because it allows you to manual aut automate the manual process that are involved in underwriting people. You can also use RPA to do data scraping and perform analytics on what's going on in the market. If you want to have some high level observability of the insure tech market, RPA is one of the tools that you will need in, in combination with serverless. It becomes a very cheap tool that is very powerful. And then one more cool thing about RPA is that it allows you to integrate with your legacy systems through automation. So this one common sample of RPA implementation that we're doing in FWD. So basically it involves an API gateway, a trigger function, a queue where we upload and distribute uh, the work to RPA-based lambdas, which typically contains Puppeteer, and we are, we usually produce the results and store store them in DynamoDB for analytics later on. So, if you want to try a sample, I will be uploading a source code soon in GitHub using this QR code. You will be able to access the sample that I showcased earlier. So. The next thing that you need to be careful, uh, to need to be aware to become a serverless ninja is serverless have limitations. So basically, it's rewarding to be mindful about serverless limitations, especially when you're proposing to your boss. So these are the common bummers that uh, will actually break your application's logic. So it has a memory memory limitation of three gigabytes and invocation payload, maximum size of six MB, plus a maximum execution time of 15 minutes for the background workers. You can only group up to maximum of 200 resources on a single cloud formation stack. So you would want to consider to break down your uh, services into smaller groups so that you don't hit the limits. And one more Thing that you need to be careful about is the limit of the synchronous API integration with API gateway. So it's limited to 30 seconds. So if your API is trying to serve data in lesser than 30 seconds, you need to you need to rethink how you implemented that API because uh, anything that responds beyond five seconds is already considered bad in the API world nowadays. So the next thing that you need to know about serverless functions is that you're gonna wrestle with code start and it's often caused by the following uh, root causes. So first one is the poor choice of language. Second one is that they're embedding too much dependencies. For example, in the JavaScript world, like people need uh, people who need access to the advanced function, they will install the entire heavyweight uh, library called uh, underscore or stuff like that. So it makes the actual uh, Lambda function heavy because this is around 4 MB library or stuff, which, which is basically ridiculous. So it causes cold start subconsciously. And then one more thing that you need to notice that like you need to embed lesser code in your Lambda function. If it's possible, you would want to consider, you might want to consider minifying them so that uh, you can uh, small and reduce the size and impact of cold start to your API. So the last thing that uh, causes cold start is the BPC integration. Basically, uh, AWS has to connect some ports so that you can connect and run your app your Lambda functions inside the virtual private cloud. So if you don't really need to run uh, Lambda functions inside BPCs, like please do avoid them. So there are cool ways to still secure your APIs without uh, resorting to BPC integration.
So the famous cold, uh, cold start busters are the right choice of language. So I'm not saying this because I really love these languages, but Go is actually good for Lambda runtimes because it embeds all the packages and it doesn't require to load external dependencies. So it's very efficient to use Go for Lambda functions. Similar for the interpreted languages, Python and JavaScript, because they actually load code on demand and as they go. So the next thing that you can do to solve cold start is to use Lambda layers. Basically, this allows you to uh, have a central package dedicated for your dependencies and duplicate code so that your multiple APIs don't have to duplicate them. And then minimize, like I mentioned earlier, you, would want to con you might want to consider reducing the usage of BPC and integration with it. Basically, you will need the BPC to whitelist it to your on-premise networks, but uh, typically this will be done on a asynchronous fashion, so you don't have to couple your RESTful APIs with BPCs. That's going to solve your cold start issues. And then there's this uh, last option or last resort I would recommend, which is basically keep warm. So it's quite popular uh, technique in the serverless world where people continuously ping their APIs just to keep them warm and prevent them from resetting and getting thrown out by the AWS internals. The next thing is serverless. It's not for everything. So Sometimes uh, serverless can cause more, more harm and it's not suitable for certain use cases. So these are the use cases related with B2B startups where they want to deploy on any cloud infrastructure. Serverless is very bad at doing this. So it's rewarding to use Docker and KS instead of serverless for this use case. And then the next thing is state loss versus foreign data storage. So if your operations run in a country that prevents uh, exporting of data into clouds that don't exist in the country, you would want to con you might want to consider using Docker and KS for this case. It's similar for uh, companies that are restricted by law to keep their data on premise, especially the banks. So this is the question and answer section. Hey, Ellen. Uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful session. Uh, we haven't received any questions so far for you. Okay, cool. Audience, you have anything? Uh, thanks, Ellen. Uh, Okay, cool. I don't have any questions from the audience. Yet. So basically, I just want to throw a shout out to people who made the presentation possible. So from my teammates, so thank you. All, and especially to Jan Shil who invited me to speak. It's really great opportunity to share to the API community. So uh, you have given us the permission to share the slide deck with the, party, uh, with the audience? Yes, sure. Uh, yes, so I'd love to please share. Do, that please to ensure you have your contact details are there, so that in case anybody has question, they can reach out to you directly okay, or through LinkedIn. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Oh, and one more thing: serverless is cooler when you use it with Quad AI. So, have we threw out a really nice presentation yesterday? So, yeah, maybe you might want to consider it. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you.